Round one, fight. Heroes never die. I'm Commander Shepard, and this is my favorite store on the Citadel. <laughs> I used to be an adventurer like you. Then I took an arrow in the knee. Power, sex, sex, power. They both come down to one thing. Hungry Gamers. Hello, 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 and welcome everyone to the 319th episode of the Hungry Gamers podcast. We are powered by 8bit.net and those sexy audio-based legends over at Audio Technica. Go upgrade your audio game today at audiotechnica.com. I am your extremely humble host, Brendan White. You can find me just about everywhere at Brendan 8 Bits. And joining me as is tradition, my podcast, Right I Die, the cream to my strawberries. You can find her on them socials at Miss Allie Hart. Miss Allie Hart, how the bloody hell are you? Doing well. How are you? How are you feeling? I am doing a lot better. My uh, my sleeping habits are still very poor due to the uh, the ongoing ripple effect of COVID. But uh, yeah. yeah, the energy levels, uh, they're not quite like low flashing battery alert like i'm not at the the 20 percent change on the iphone when it switches to red i'm above that now but i'm i still reckon i'm sitting at like 50 percent or so on average like the the energy levels are shot like i had had a lunch meeting yesterday and yes in typical fashion i over ate and gorged myself but afterwards i nearly fell asleep driving like to the next meeting in the car like i was so tired and so fatigued going from there to there and then I uh, eventually finished that meeting, got home, went to have a cheeky lie down. I'm like, oh, I could, I reckon I could sneak a quick 20 to 30. And about two minutes into that, I was just falling asleep and then my phone rang and I couldn't get back to sleep and I'm still upset today. Yeah, like the after effects and tiredness is just no joke. This kind of just hangs around for like the longest time. It sucks. It really does. And I didn't do myself any favors. I went to, we went to this place for, for a burger yesterday uh, called Baldwin Canteen. Shout out to those dudes and dudettes working there. But like two doors down, just by coincidence, coincidence there's a new One Piece themed cafe that's opened up in Melbourne here in the last couple of months called okay. One Plus Piece. And so we popped in after that, but I was too full to eat anything off their menu. But instead they had these milkshakes which they were calling freak shakes and i'm like oh okay let's let's dance so um in in sort of homage to to pulp fiction i paid 17 dollars for a shake because i wanted to know what a 17 dollars shake tasted like and it tasted pretty good but i think i'm diabetic now and i'm still digesting it at the moment yeah i did see a photo of this marvelous dessert beverage um it was pretty crazy i'm not usually a fan of these extravagant milkshakes that came quite popular in like in australia sydney in the cafe scene of these just massive decorations on top of a a, a milkshake or a, yeah i think it was just a milkshake and that, to me it was just like that's just too much where do you put it all i tried to put it all in my stomach I could not because, um, yeah, this thing was a monstrosity. Like I didn't have a ruler handy because why would I? Why would you? But it stood, I reckon, about 30 centimeters tall Mm -hmm. and it was like it was peanut butter and salted caramel flavor. But then there was like an exuberant amount of ice cream in there. There was Mm -hmm. a crazy amount of fairy floss on the top. There was M&M eggs on there. There was a couple of ice vovos stuck to the side. There was wafer biscuits. There was Tim Tams. There was, remember, is it jam drops? Is that, the, remember the biscuit? It was sort of like a shortbread biscuit with like jam in the middle and that was it? Really simple. I thought simple. they were called tarts. Like they were called something, like something like, like a jam tarts. tart maybe? Yeah, jam yeah. tarts or something like that. Haven't seen them in any capacity in like a decade. And there was a couple of them stuck to the to the shake as well. So I was sort of working my way through the bickies, sipping my way through the milk. I, I finished the milk shake, left a few biscuits and I left like, most of the fairy floss because I didn't have time for that. But holy shit, this thing knocked me into next week. It was tasty. And a one plus piece cafe, it's, it's a good vibe. And the burgers look legit. So I'm going to go back. But yeah, it was just a little spur of the moment trip there after going to another place two doors down. Incredible. Mm. I haven't eaten since then. I didn't eat dinner last night. 
I haven't had breakfast this morning because I just have no appetite. I'm still, I'm just full of milk and... Just running off sugar. Because the burger I had at this other place, the easiest way to describe the taste of it, because it had a heap of different meats and then I added some things as I like to do. It tasted like a generic, like meat lovers pizza, whether you get it from a a cafe or like a Domino's. It had that flavor profile to it, which was fine. It was delicious, but I'm still so full. Man, like... To be running on those, like, because you would have, like, so that sounded like like one of those, like, hearty meals where you eat and you, then you're instantly tired. But then you proceeded to consume something that would have had just a high scale of sugar where you usually actually reach a high first and then come mm-hmm. crashing down. So your system must have be been shot. We're not young anymore, Brendan. No, we can't no. be doing these things. I, I am dumb, Ali. I am very dumb at doing these things and I do them more often than I care to admit. But uh, yeah, it was delicious. I would recommend both the Baldwin Canteen and one one plus piece here in uh, Melbourne. Very delicious, tasty treats. But uh, just bear in mind, you might not have an appetite or the energy for 24 to 48 hours afterwards because uh, there is not enough coffee in the world to uh, see me through this Saturday. Wake but yeah, we're man. here. Episode 319 of THG. Uh, we got plenty. Of, well, not plenty. We got a we got an assortment of news. It's been a bit of a a lean week as far as things that we we sort of cherry picked to talk about. But I guess we could start things off with what we've been doing. I'm just going to quickly skim over the top of what I've been playing. Haven't been playing a ton of variety. Uh, I jumped into uh, Fortnite Chapter Four Season Two or Fortnite Season Four Chapter Two. Yeah. I always forget which way it's written. It's that, right? I think it's season and then chapter. Yeah, season four, chapter two that we mentioned last week that was sort of just uh, released around the globe. Super fun, super frantic. The the blades and traversing the map with the blades is a whole thing. The, the Japanese-inspired sort of Neon City that's dropped in is awesome. Some of the, like, the location changes, great. Some of the weapons they've added, slashed, or removed... I've got a few little bugbears on. I'm yeah. missing some of the guns that are missing, but overall, it's been uh, it's been enjoyable. I've been having a good time. I've only got like one win all week. I cannot get crowns to save my life, but uh, it's been a hell of a time. Yeah, it's pretty sweaty out there, and I've got to say that I love the sword. Like after watching like a bunch of professionals use it and seeing its full capabilities, I have destroyed some teams, like running duos and just like just coming in like a freaking grease lightning and just slicing up a team. It is pretty, I I feel like this is going to be one of the ones that maybe gets a little bit nerfed just because it's just ridiculous. The, the damage it can do and then the traversal that it can do. So um, especially before any kind of competition starts up again, I'm actually not aware if there's been any comps going at the moment so but yeah it's it's pretty cool and the 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 city change with all the neon lights and uh like and those crazy grind rails in the city as well so cool like so fun hard to navigate sometimes but mm-hmm. still pretty fun i don't know who was landing shots while using it um but either way it's still it's a fun addition so i i am pretty impressed with like how what the team um what the team add to fortnite just to keep it fresh and interesting and just they keep on always just pushing the bar and keep on um, leveling up and keeping things there's a apparently a new creative mode that will be coming in soon too so yeah which is nuts and we get our uh, Aaron Jaeger popping up in a couple of weeks time as well so we're going to have even more yes. crazy traversal with yes. their little uh their little um what are they called rope swing like gas powered rope mechanisms that's going to be the yeah. new way to traverse that'll be like the spider-man glove I am still pretty mad that the alternative skin isn't his Titan form. So, mm. spoilers. Yeah. yeah. Uh. We'll see. We'll see. But it's fun. It's awesome. Yeah. The the blade as a means of traversal. I I use that just to get around. I don't use it use it too often in battle, but to to zip around the map quickly, whether it be close a gap to try and pinch somebody or to open a gap up because you get shot in the butt. It's a it's a great thing to have in your in your arsenal there, but it's <laughs> super fun. Really enjoying it. You know, Epic are just releasing content at such a high quality. It's it's always fun, and just the little subtle tweaks that they make to the game formula to keep it feeling fresh is awesome. Mm. I also went out last weekend and watched sixty five, the the film oh, yeah. starring Adam Driver. Uh, and it's actually produced or co-produced by Sam Raimi. So with those two 
people involved and then it tying into like science fiction and space with dinosaurs. I'm like, you know, this could be, this could be something that I could really enjoy. But um, boy, how wrong I was. It oh, is no. not a great film. The story's a mess. The, the sort of force feeding into this like surrogate father daughter relationship he's got with one of these one of these passengers because he's like a could say he's like a space pilot courier and he's like transferring these these people that are in stasis across the galaxy to whatever it doesn't really explain why he's taking them there uh but yeah then they crash land on this planet this planet is uh you know inhabited by dinosaurs and various other prehistoric like creatures Mm -hmm. which you don't even see a ton of you don't get like there's not enough dinosaurs in this movie for one and then like shoehorning in this like forced father-daughter relationship with one of like the only living the only other surviving crew member of this this transport mission and conveniently she can't speak english so they can't communicate so there's this awkward cuteness that they try and put into it as well like the tone is just Wah. But yeah, the movie was not a good time. I uh, oh. would not recommend someone spending money to go check it out at the cinemas, that's for sure. Oh, that's a shame. It looked yeah. like it had some potential. Yeah. Yeah, the best parts of it's in the trailer, I think, which makes me sad. But uh, something else that makes me sad, but also very happy, the finale of season one of The Last of Us aired this past week as well. And holy guacamole. Uh, I am still very numb and still very emotionally distraught after watching those nine episodes over the past couple of months. But yeah, HBO uh, have hit a home run on this one. Obviously, we're seeing the numbers where it's outperforming things like uh, the most recent House of the Dragon series as far as you know average viewership. People are thirsting for The Last of Us, which is very, very, very well deserved because... Yeah, Druckmann and, and Mazin, who uh, you know wrote and directed, produced, and everything else, had you know had a lot of things to do with this with this adaptation. Have hit it out of the park, and I can't wait for more of this to hit our screens. In I guess in the next two years, we might get season two. But yeah, it is special. Anyone that hasn't watched it, I know you mentioned you're a couple episodes back. Yes. You need to you need to give it some time and check it out because yeah this is special this show is very special recency bias aside I think it's going to go down as, as one of the greats yeah like I it do- definitely seems to have um fa- like achieved favor in both the gaming space and then those that weren't familiar a lot of people have really enjoyed it um I'm curious to see um how well it does during award season. It it'd be pretty spectacular to see like especially for like the team that worked on the game or, and like having that connection to now say like obviously getting the accolades with the game and getting awards in that way and then now getting awards through a different media of the same story. That would just have to be incredible. Yeah, um it'll be awesome to see if we manage to get a a game that does have such uh, such a big successful run. Like we just saw everything everywhere all at once just dominate award season everywhere. Yeah. For for a film that is very un Hollywood, I guess you could say, as far yeah. as the typical movies that, that take home those honors. So maybe this will ride that momentum and, you know, sweep the the sort of T V based awards. Uh, like what we've seen with with everything everywhere all at once taking home award after award at every ceremony it's rolled into the last 12 months but yeah if if it does win a lot of awards i think it's more than justified it feels like more than you know i'm not just looking at this with with rose colored glasses here because i love the game so much i think this tv show is very special and even talking to people that haven't played the game Mm-hmm. Whether it be you know people people our age or you know friends you know in our in our friendship circle that haven't played it that have loved it or even talking to like my mum or my auntie randomly messaged me the other day mm-hmm. and was talking about how great it is and, and you know they're not gamers but they just love this story and these characters so uh, yeah they've they've uh, hit the sweet spot as far as converting this to screen and and yeah I'm looking forward to to more in in the coming years. Yeah, even I have recommended it to people just that are not familiar with the game or anything like that and just said, no, it is it is clearly a fantastic story and it's definitely well made. So just recommending it on that basis alone just seems fair enough. For sure, for sure. And what have you been doing this past week, Miss Hart? 
Well, I finally played Destiny 2 Lightfall. Um, mm-hmm. Able to like grab a few people together and complete the campaign and work on it together and that, that kind of avenue. But um, I have to agree with the general consensus of a lot of people out there that have experienced uh, the Lightfall campaign and say that it was very lackluster. I think this only comes off the having such a fantastic campaign um, out of the Witch Queen and then being the follow-up to that, you obviously had to really reach a high standard to keep that momentum going. And unfortunately, Lightfall just really falls short of it. Um, that makes it's, me sad. It's, yeah, <laughs> it is. It is, And especially also in the sense that I, I also agree with a lot of people where we are taken to a new planet, which is Neptune. And um, yeah, like you, we, we've been given this space. We're in this um, city called Neom- Neomuna. And it like, you know, it's kind of like synth wave, retro wave. Like they've got this wonderful kind of like vibe to it. But for the most part, it feels empty. Like it feels very empty and barren. And I understand there's some things in the campaign that kind of links to that. But even so, even with other other areas in Destiny, they still make make the environment feel lived in. It feels mm-hmm. like, you know, it, it feels like very like present and has like but yeah, it just it feels weird. It's a very weird space, and um, they 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 bring in these wonderful characters, these almost like like these new characters into the Destiny universe that are just amazing. They're like they they just come across as like gods, and even they kind of fall short. Like I'm sure there's probably a lot of hidden lore, like Destiny and the team of Bungie like to sometimes not like hit you with all the lore. Sometimes they're like, hey, if you want to look for it, you can find it out there. But even so, there wasn't a lot to kind of compel you to investigate. So yeah, it's just, it's unfortunate. Um, In gaming mechanics, I actually enjoyed it. The new strand mechanic was a lot of fun, even though I feel it was kind of weird how they incorporated it into the story. Um, mm-hmm. It wasn't like you like instantly unlocked it and it was accessible. They kind of let you have it in, in parts, which felt very jolting and didn't feel like you were getting to experience it to its full extent. So yeah, overall, like I, like it was enjoyable, but yeah, after such a high as Witch Queen, it definitely felt like a low in comparison. So, um, but yeah, experiencing that now and then just doing all the other stuff attached and checking out new gear and stuff, it's it's good. But yeah, I just think if anyone that did play Witch Queen to drop your standards, if you're thinking about dropping into the campaign this time. Yeah, I can certainly lower my standards, that's for sure. So I will uh, yeah keep that in mind when I jump into, into Lightfall because... Yeah, like Witch Queen, it's very recent for me. I only played it maybe, I don't know, four to six weeks ago, give or take. So it's still very fresh in my mind. So I need to try and hit reset before I jump into Lightfall. But yeah, I'll, I'll get there. I'll get there. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing seeing how it translates because, yeah, from an aesthetic standpoint, from what I've seen from gameplay and trailers and stuff, it looks phenomenal and right right up my alley. But yeah, if the, if the narrative's a bit lacking, which is, it's going to be a bit disappointing, but... It's okay. Destiny hasn't always been a home run hitter when it comes to direct storytelling anyway. Apart from like recently, like Witch Queen was great. Like it was a bit more direct and we got a lot more backstory and character development, which felt very undestiny for me, I guess, at least. Yeah, it it definitely diverted from the standard of like, here's a bit of story, there's more to it, but you've got to look for it. Um, I agree, Witch Queen was very much like here it is, feel it, experience it and understand why and how it connects to everything else. Yeah, so it's a shame that it looks like Lightfall's not hitting those high highs there, but still looking forward to uh, giving it a play here. But mm. um, yeah, we also got some some very, very, very sad news that broke this morning as well. <sighs> yeah. uh, everyone's favourite sort of leader of, of the Titans, Lance, Lance Reddick, a.k.a. Zavala, he has uh, passed away unexpectedly at age 60 this morning, which is horrible, and we send our thoughts and our love out to anyone in the, in the broader Reddick family. Uh, he's a stalwart of pop culture, and, and he's, he's a pillar of so many franchises that, that you and I absolutely love, and for him to, to pass overnight where no one knew that he was potentially battling anything, or you know, we don't know the full issues as to what happened that caused his his uh tragic passing but yeah gone at 60 after being 
front and center in so many franchises in games in film and in tv that that we and everyone else adore uh, over the last you know couple of decades is a big shock oh absolutely crushing news um honestly couldn't believe what i was reading just browsing through twitter um and just seeing that and then there's that little moments of like disbelief um Mm -hmm. that kind of happen and when it was confirmed i was just absolutely crushed like he is an incredible actor and he always has such a presence, whether he is like lead, leading a scene or even just supporting the cast around him. He was just, he was so incredibly talented as well as, you know, being able to curve the line between comedy and seriousness and just absolutely a a, a, a voice that can be recognized. He's just He's been in so many um, bits of media that I've enjoyed very recently. And then obviously this attachment to one of my favorite games of all time is just, it's just, in, it's incredibly sad. And it's, it's, it's definitely a, um, it's going to be felt and it's going to, he's going to be definitely missed. Yeah, definitely. And he, and he seems like, obviously we don't know him from a personal standpoint, but from everything we've seen online and on social media yeah. and even just his portrayals of, of such big big characters yeah he, he's left a, he's left a, a big hole there and a, and a massive lasting impression that's that's nothing but positive like yeah he's he's graced resident evil horizon zero dawn destiny uh he was also in like things like bosch you mentioned yeah and you know in the blacklist and fringe and oz and the wire and lost and so many other big 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 franchises that mean a lot to so many people and you know even even like john wick is another one we mentioned obviously yeah. we've got we've got chapter four coming out just this week uh, he, ahead as well lance recently um uh lent his voice to a a, a very important character in the critical role franchise in the animated That's series right. yeah, thordak yeah so um yeah it's just like he just he yeah, he just did incredible work and he just he loved being a part of it all and he just it seemed like everything that he attached to him like he attached himself to he just loved and became one with so you know, it's really hard to find sometimes yeah 100 percent. so uh yeah sending sending all the love to the broader reddick family and, and yeah sort of pull one out tonight for for one of the legends of the uh the the acting and, and and pop culture space because uh yeah he's he's probably touched a lot of us indirectly through his work in, in a whole host of franchises and mm-hmm. um yeah 60 60 years young that's that's sort of gone way too soon so uh Definitely. yes sending all the love out yeah i guess um speaking of legends um the only other thing that i wanted to share was i actually um watched a few episodes of uh, history of the world part 2 Mm-hmm. Um, which is uh, a product of uh, Mel Brooks. Um, he uh, years and years and years ago, I believe in like maybe seventies. I believe I should have probably checked this. Um, he did History of the World Part One, um, and it was a, a collection of you know humorous ta- retellings of moments in history with uh, comedians and the funny people of the time. And um, it seems like now. Um, recently, he has decided to work with a lot of uh, legends in the comedy space today to develop uh, History of the World Part 2. Now, Part 1 was a movie. Part 2 is a series. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, names attached, we've got Nick Kroll, who is currently just absolutely smashing it in the comedy space, both um, in person and um, animated. Uh, we also have Wanda Sykes as well and um, Ike Barinholtz. Uh, and there's a, a whole bunch of other names that are attached to this. Um, they all do these little tiny skits about moments in history. And I've got to say, I've got to be completely honest. The first two episodes were hilarious. Like <laughs> I, I literally did an old woman cackle and slapped my husband. I laughed that hard. Like it's it was so cliche, but that's how funny it was. And then we followed it up with episode three and that it completely fell flat, which is wild because Jack Black was also in it. But um, yeah, so I, I have yet to watch past episode three because it kind of like left me a bit kind of stunned on mm-hmm. how you can go from hit to hit and then kind of completely miss on a second, uh, sorry, on a third episode. But um, I think for anyone that might be interested, um, definitely check out the first two episodes of um, History of the World Part 2. 
Over here, it is being streamed on Hulu. Um, so I'm not too sure what the counterpart in Australia might be. Be Disney so, Plus if it's Disney here Plus? In, in the AU. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, at least check out the first two episodes. Um, there's a pretty funny skit um, with Nick Kroll and um, uh, JB Smoove where they do um, the the betrayal of uh, Jesus with Judas, but they do a, a Curb Your Enthusiasm kind of angle on it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty funny. It's pretty creative. Um, and so just like I said, check out the first two episodes and then don't maybe expect much on the third. But. Yeah, I'm just, just looking into it now. So there's there's eight episodes in, in this part two. It's insane to me that he's still working at like 95, 96 years old. Yeah. Old Mel Brooks. Yeah. He's been around a good long while. And, and looking at sort of the broader cast here, it seems they've got like the entire cast of Jackass playing various characters in uh, in this season from what I can see. They, there is an incredible scene. <laughs> Look at me laughing, thinking about it, <laughs> um, with some members of Jackass, um, with, um, oh, I've completely forgotten his name, the lead guy of Jackass. Um, Johnny Knoxville? Johnny Knoxville. He plays Rasputin. And there's just this scene, and, like, Wee Man is in the scene as well, and I'm not going to say anything. I want people to experience it, but, like, just to see that moment, I'm just like, who thought of this? Who thought of this? Um, but it, it actually made me laugh really hard, so... Yeah, I'll have to give it a look. Seth 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 Rogen makes an appearance mm-hmm. in this season somewhere as well. Like, so there's there's some big names attached to to what they got going on here with part two. Because yeah, I was I was looking at it. Part one was was a film that was done in 1981. Oh, so 80. This, yeah. yeah, this thing is uh, rolling in like what close to close to well over 40 years later, which is which is a crazy to think about. They've done a part two, but. Yeah, to still be working and still have that comedic timing in your nineties, you know, that's that's very admirable and very impressive. Like, I will be just a husk by that age, or just dust. But yeah. this guy's still making making humorous content that's going to live on. Yeah, well, Mel Brooks always like kind of likes to flirt with the line of uh, riskiness and comedy, so um, that that still is very present um, okay. in in this series. So. Okay, so yeah, I'll check it out. So Hulu for for America and probably the broader world, and then uh, yeah, Disney Plus for for the rest of us. So uh, yeah, it look, looks like it could be a fun time. Yeah. Something else that's a fun time, listeners, is our Kofi page, ko fi dot com forward slash we are eight bit. You can support us for the low low price, starting from one dollar per month. Get you exclusive access to content, giveaways, and more. If you want more than just what's on the Kofi, you can also do so by heading to shop8bit.net and get yourself some tasty, tasty merchandise with a whole host of designs on a whole host of fashionable styles, t-shirts, hats, hoodies, and everything else in between. If you want to check out 8-Bit content as a whole, videogamesandculture.com for all things 8-Bit. Be sure to check out our slew of podcasts. Be sure to follow and join our Discord and also chuck us a follow on TikTok or all the other socials as well, at We Are 8-Bit, because we are starting to churn out a regular assortment of video-based content. It's only taken us several years, but uh, we've got we stuff dropping <laughs> every week now. Better late than never, listeners. So yeah, at We Are 8-Bit on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, etc., etc. But, Miss Hart, I think it's time to jump into this. This week's news headlines. Presented by Audio-Technica. All right, the first little quick hitter, Raid Shadow Legends, everyone's favorite spammy advertisement mobile game that cannot be escaped, is getting a 10-episode animated series called Raid Call of the Arbiter, and it will be watchable every single week with a new episode dropping on YouTube starting from May the 18th. So I will say, like, I know nothing about Raid apart from just... It's spamming me everywhere I seem to go. There's ads on every device that I seem to touch and content creators all over the world are constantly doing paid activations, flogging this game on Twitch, YouTube, etc., etc. But the characters, you know, and, you know, high fantasy... It's it's you know lazy lazy comp just because it's it's fantasy and spellcasting stuff you know like it's it's mobile World of Warcraft in a way yeah. probably not correct at all by using that description but as far as the characters you know you've got warriors spellcasters good and evil etc 
I'm I'm going to give it a watch because I like fantasy. I like animated series. So maybe this could be okay? Question mark. Like they make enough money to to build something of high standard and like of a high animation quality. Mm. Fingers crossed. So uh, I'm intrigued. I yeah. I don't want to poo poo like something that like I haven't even seen yet. But I'm going to say that like it's I think it's pretty interesting that it is only going to be on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm also wondering the quality of the animation or, you know, like for the most part, like, I don't want to say this where it makes, it makes it sound like it's going to sound like bad, bad, no matter how I say it, uh, <laughs> animation can some, like based on how technology has expanded, um, making animation is very accessible now. So mm-hmm. it, it, it is definitely more accessible. It's obviously a lot more cheaper to do now. So um, I, I also question the quality on, like, have they gone a very easy, affordable route to get these pushed out? And then I also wonder, are these just going to be, like, 20, 30-minute advertisements as well? Because, like you said, the, the only reason why I know what this is is because every YouTube that, like, I watched – uh, where, you know, it was a Twitch streamer or YouTuber or something like that. They all did the raid Shadow Legends little ad bit at the start. And, like, even some of the YouTubers that I watched would also make fun of it. Like, it became that mm. common to kind of mention it. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at the trailer right now, and they've de- they've gone the digital animation style. So, it's not sort of hand-drawn. It's It's digital... It doesn't look too bad from a visual perspective, but like I'm, I'm watching it muted because we're recording as we go. But I couldn't tell you what the Christ is going on here. There's just just people fighting from all different race races and parts of the world there. But it looked pretty. There's a there's a 45 second trailer doing the rounds that was released a couple of days ago. Doesn't give much away. I don't know if there's any raid Shadow Legends lore keepers out there that know the <laughs> ins and outs as far as what happens in this in this universe. But yeah, I'll give it a look. And yeah, so if they're is. yeah if if they're twenty to thirty minute episodes that are going to drop every week for for ten weeks, cool. But maybe they are going to be only like a little ten minute banger, something like that, that might collectively combine to the runtime of a movie. But yeah, we'll see. Well, yeah. I'll reserve judgment until I till I watch a watch an episode, but right now it just seems like you said like it feels a bit more parodied than anything where they're just like let's just try and cash in more, you know? Yeah. We're we're getting money every which way as it is, but uh, yeah, let's see if we can sort of pull through and ride that momentum of things like uh, Legend of Vox Machina and Arcane and stuff like that having recent success in that animated space. Yeah. Something that is the direct uh, opposite of success is what Meta have just done this past week. They've laid off 10,000 employees this week, and that is after they already put the broom through Meta just this past November, where they also fired 11,000 people. So in the past four months, 21,000 people have been left without a job that were working at Meta. So... Holy shit, Zuckerberg and co, you know, we know he's ruthless. We know he does not uh, muck around, but mm. 21,000 layoffs within the span of 90 to 120 days is absurd and we wish everyone the best. But man, the the tech industry at the moment, they are just clearly hemorrhaging money and doing whatever they can to maintain profitability, which means the expense of, uh, you know, good stuff. Good jobs. Gone. Yeah. It's actually been quite, um, pretty shocking to see how much the tech industry has been hitting a, a decline. And I'd, a lot of people were speculating that it was due to a um, mass hiring due to COVID and COVID times. And then now that that is over, they've speculated that that's why these firings are happening. But I wouldn't be um, so shocked to see that it's just more of, you know, the, the tech industry – having investors and investments and these investments not paying out. So then they've had to just absolutely cull um, as much as they can to, I don't know, break a profit, break even, or, you know, I'm not too attached to how like these kind of like um, finances go in the tech industry, but like there's a lot of risk and especially in the tech scene and just seeing these mass firings, especially with Meta that is attached to, such a like I don't even know is Facebook still classified as a juggernaut? Like, 
Is, is this, I think so. It's more of a thing where I've kind of detached myself from it, so I just I just don't know how mm. much of a thing it is anymore. But yeah, like it, it is. It's scary. It's a scary time, especially if you're trying to get into the space and you're seeing that you know, you're now going to be also trying to compete with another, you know, twenty one thousand. Yeah, it's it's nuts. Like it's such a competitive market but then it's such a volatile market like so many people are trying to make this their career and their life and yet their job can be taken away in the blink of an eye because yeah the the investment's not there or just these aggressive growth strategies that tech companies put in that are just not sustainable like yeah they they might pop up and grow 50 or 100 percent year on year for a few years but that's not sustainable long term like you, you hit you hit a peak, you hit you hit the high and, and you can't continue to grow at such an aggressive sort of uh, timeline. But a lot of these higher ups just think, no, that's what we need every year. If you can't get it, we'll find someone that can. Otherwise, we'll just fire that and, and hide our profitability, profitability in other ways. So yeah, yeah 21,000 people on the back of, you know, the, the talks we've had over the last, last couple of months with Microsoft and a whole host of other companies all scaling back and, and laying off employees on mass, it's it's really scary. So uh, yeah, just be safe out there, and uh, maybe maybe be a little bit more calculated with your next potential move to try and find something a little bit more stable. Because this industry is anything but that. It feels like yeah, exactly. Some good news though. Shifting gears again, Shuhei Yoshida will be awarded a BAFTA fellowship at the BAFTA Game Awards on March the thirtieth. The fellowship recognizes Yoshida's work as, in quotes, a champion of independent developers. BAFTA said through his personal social media presence and his corporate endeavors, he has consistently nurtured the creativity and innovation of the indie games industry, and regularly champions indie games through podcasts, official PlayStation videos, and the wider games media. End quote. The organization added Yoshida currently is head of Sony Interactive Entertainment's independent developer initiative after spending his entire career as the platform holder in various roles since 1993. Among others, he was president of SIE Studio uh, Worldwide Studios from 2008 to 2019 before being replaced by Herman Hulst. So shout out to Shuhei doing great work. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's getting, getting a bit up there in age, the fantastic gentleman, but yet he is on his social media accounts, daily campaigning, showcasing, spotlighting, and giving runway to indie games that you know, a lot of people might not have ever heard of without Shu getting involved and, uh, you know, throwing, throwing a lifeline out or, or just paying it forward. And I've never met the man, but from what I can see through interviews and various, um, you know, podcasts he's done and just appearances. He seems like a genuinely good human and he does genuinely good things for this industry and especially for the indie scene. So a uh, hat tip to you, good squire. Yeah, he's definitely one of the more prominent members in the like upper space of the like gaming like gaming networks between like Microsoft and Sony. But he mm-hmm. still seems very like he sounds really bad, but he still seems very accessible. Um, He seems very open and honest about things. And yeah, just like what you said, a lot of his interactions online or like on like podcasts or just anything like that, he just seems like a really down to earth, genuine guy who loves what he does, loves video games. And as this, uh, uh, this, this story kind of tells is that he is very passionate about indie games and he loves getting the word out there about it. So, um, and, um, uh, you know, an accolade from him would mean a lot for a little indie developer too. So uh, it's nice. I'm kind of surprised that this was like an award to be given out or an, mm. an acknowledgement, I guess. Yeah, it's nice to see and, and it's more than justified. And, and, and like you said, the, the, the accessibility that he seems to have, like I remember when he, was, when he was here in Australia last year around PAX and like just following his social posts on Twitter and he was like, you know, I'm looking for this or... The, just the the constant spotlighting of all the games that were on uh, the pack show floor from from all the indie developers, like getting getting that tweet and getting tens or a hundred thousands of extra sets of eyes on that product can mean life or death to lot, some of yeah. these games. So, yeah, the the indirect, I guess, influence that he's had over the success of probably hundreds upon hundreds of games over the years is you know really impressive so so yeah shout out to Shu and uh yeah very well deserved and um yeah keep doing what you're doing because 
even he's he's brought a lot of games to my attention that either I haven't given the time of day to or I didn't know about. So uh, yeah, he's certainly uh, doing God's work out there. Uh, nice little quick hitter. The European regulators have delayed a decision on Microsoft's proposed 69 billion US dollar acquisition of Activision Blizzard after the company submitted another round of remedies in its effort to gain approval. The European Commission had previously announced a provisional deadline of the 25th of April of 2023 for its decision on the controversial takeover, but as reported, that has now shifted to the 22nd of May of 2023 as its reviews as it continues to review Microsoft's latest submissions. There's a ton more back and forth. There's a ton more transcripts out there if you want to get really out in the weeds. But the short version is we are a little over two months away from seeing if the European regulators are going to green light or red light this acquisition. And if we can finally put this thing in the rearview mirror and move forward, because at the moment, Microsoft are continually doing deals with other third-party platforms out there as far as, you know, these 10-year deals in relation to Call of Duty Mm -hmm. and also uh, cloud-based partnerships. So they are working still with all these other other developers or publishers thinking that this deal is going to go through and and they're signing contracts based off this Activision Blizzard uh, acquisition happening. So we're going to find out in the next two and a bit months what happens here and I'm going to be very, very happy to see the end of this because I'm just about sick of talking about it every other week, Ali. I agree. It's it's kind of like a broken record. It feels like we kind of like go back and forth and two steps forward, four steps back. But um, it's 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 good to see that like like we don't want big companies being able to just buy willy nilly, and it's good to see that external sources are also being attentive on these matters as well but um i mean it's 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 more the it's more the shitty bickering pettiness that kind of gets attached to it that i'm mm-hmm. just kind of done with so um i also have a um a, a, a wasn't a bet was it it was it was a agreement between. <laughs> we do have a, a a friendly friendly wager where i say it's going to get done this year but you say it's going to be kicked to next year yeah it's going to get pushed so. so we'll find out. Yeah, we will find we will out. Find but out. Uh, yeah, I just want it done one way or another, please. Let's let's move on with our lives. But something that's going to be coming out not this year, but next year, which is fantastic, is a game called Dead Static Drive. The stylish and inventive mashup of driving, surviving, and monster unaliving has finally locked in a launch window after many, many, many years of eager players pestering the Melbourne studio Ruben Games for a release date. Thanks in part to the team's monumental efforts to secure funding from Vic Screen's Victorian Production Fund, it's been able to announce that Dead Static Drive will launch in Q3 of 2024. Well, that's certainly still a long ways off. It's exciting and heartening to see the hard work of a local studio recognized and supported by Vic Screen in a way that puts light and respite at the end of a long tunnel. There's a quote here from Lena Van Deventer, who is the creative producer at Ruben Games, saying, The Vic Screen application process was rigorous and competitive, and we're proud our application was approved by a panel of our peers. It means so, so much. So this is a game that I initially played at PAX maybe seven years ago? Really? Six years ago? Yeah, it might have been like one of our first collective PAXs we went to. Wow. And I played it. And I loved it. And I've been very excited for this game. And it's been bubbling along for many (laughs) a year. But it's awesome to see that we finally have a release window. It's dropping on Xbox and PC in that Q3 2024 window. It's also going to be available day one on Xbox Game Pass, which is great. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Dead Static Drive coming out Q3 2024. Shout out to Ruben Games. And shout out to uh, Victorian Production Fund via Vic Screen because that helped make this game a reality. And it's uh, bringing it to our screens in our hands in a little over, what, 16 months time, give or take? But let's go. Yeah. I mean, stylized, it looks fantastic. I'm I'm not familiar with it. I don't think I got my hands on it. But just looking over some screenshots from the game, it it looks great. It looks like it has a really like cool vibe to it and like a lot of nods to kind of like retro wave kind of styles as well as uh some great monster design that i love we're seeing a lot of like bone and skull attached to um physical forms here so it looks it looks pretty cool it's actually piqued my interest now 
Mm, yeah, keep that on your radar, Miss Hart, and keep that on your radar, listeners, because, uh, yeah, Q3 2024 will be able to finally play Dead Static Drive, so uh, very exciting. All right, the next bit of news, I've just titled it as Starfield Sucks. There's no alien lovemaking. So uh, Starfield, obviously Bethesda's forthcoming space RPG, has been given a restricted rating here in Australia. The game's classification is primarily due to interactive drug use, as well as a strong impact of violence and some nudity. The Australian Classification Board has a particularly low tolerance to drug use in games. The likes of Disco Elysium, DayZ, and RimWorld were all initially banned from sale here in Australia due to themes of drug use. And so too was Bethesda's own Fallout 3 way back in 2008, which had the incentive for drug use toned down. Indeed, Bethesda is no stranger to drugs in its games. The fictional jet occurs frequently in the Fallout series. And it seems Starfield will be no different. Further, while the game contains some nudity, the game does not include any sex, so don't expect any intimate relationships with the game's companions to be shown on screen. Obviously, most recently, Starfield was delayed slash confirmed as far as the release date of September the 6th of 2023. But yeah, come September the 6th, there'll be no having sex with interspecies all over the universe, which makes me sad. I think it's incredibly interesting that Australia has such a strict policy um, in the classification of these games. And it, it's 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 not just directly connected into the drug use, but I believe they're very anti-drug use in a positive manner where you're your player needs to take a drug to feel better or heal themselves in any kind of way. Um, so I'm assuming if there's drugs and it's a negative effect, then I think they're pretty okay with it because it's sending a message. Um, but yeah, just Australian classification board kind of always getting in the way of some games is it like, although I just previously said it's good to have people interfere when it comes to things, but I just, it's, it's, I don't know. It's just a little embarrassing come to mind. Like, it's just like, 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 why that? Like, why is that the hill that we're dying on? And then, obviously, there's the, the no sex on screen. So, I'm sorry, Brendan. Um, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's why it's yeah. been delayed. They're taking it out. Australia was too strict, so they're taking it out. Or they're putting it in. Yeah, that's a, a the matter delay. of speaking. <laughs> a matter of speaking, they're putting it in. And um, taking it out and putting it back in. <laughs> putting it back in again. And then having a smoke. Um, but <laughs> I, Space smoke. Space smoke. I mean, we were talking about like what Bethesda had previously had in their games and why would it be expected? Um, marriage should be, dating and marriage should be a possibility though. They shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, you have your wives in your, in your various Bethesda uh, RPGs. So mm. yeah, I guess you might be able to marry some person from another, from another alien race. But Hell I yeah. guess, like from what a lot of married couples I hear about, um, you know, there, there's no sex in the marriage, so it makes sense why it's not in the game. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's uh, I guess it's on brand in that in that regard. But yeah, Starfield coming out sixth of September. I'm excited for that. I'm sad that I won't be able to sleep with all the weird aliens, but uh, you know what? There's plenty of other ways that I can I can do that in in other games. I can go yes, back and 100%. replay Mass Effect, or just uh, jump on the internet and find plenty of things that'll show me that. But guaranteed. Yeah, I completely agree with you regarding the Australian Classification Board, though. Like we've mentioned them infrequently on this podcast due to their their Mr. Mackie South Park mentality of drugs are bad. Like, yeah, I, I understand that, yeah, you don't want to actively promote drug use in a game to give you some type of buff or benefit because, yeah, that's bad messaging for kids. But then when these games are classified as 15 plus, 18 plus, kids shouldn't be playing the game anyway. Exactly. So, you know, it's, it's a catch-22 and yet the things that get thrown on our screen willy-nilly without any any issues or pushback constantly exactly. is always baffling. Like, you know, Game of Thrones and House of the Dragons, the easiest one you throw about because, you know, there's rape, there's incest, there's murder, there's all types of these horrible, horrible things that no one bats an eyelid about. But lo and behold, you take a bit of jet in Fallout 3 to uh, nullify some kind type of ailment that's that's the devil's work right there. No way, no how. We can't approve that. So uh, yeah, settle down, classification board. 
you could see more messed up stuff on the you know Australian public TV than you could mm-hmm. from having to purchase a a game that, ha- like you said, has been you know received its rating that is clearly stating that a child should not be playing this or a, you know anyone that would be you know influenced in any kind of way. And like you know, growing up, we had SBS. Like shit, we yeah. used to see on SBS and that's public access. We could watch that any da- damn time. So you know. Even like, even neighbors. I mean, neighbors, yeah, yeah. But like, I guess they were always kind of showing it in a negative sense. It was always a lesson to be learned. Mm. But yeah, it's just, it's just, it always makes Australia just like, even though we were just talking about how Film Victoria was funding gaming studios and Australian gaming studios are really starting to get on the forefront of, you know, setting this, you know, setting a name for Australian uh, devs. Um, we, we we're taking a step back here by, you know, being like, uh, you know, uh, like, 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 like it's so, so far behind on mm-hmm. how media is consumed. And we're still in this weird kind of stage where it's like, oh, no, no, video games are, are only for children. And there's no possible other, you know, group that would, you know, intake this uh, media that this would be allowed or understood um, on, a, on a different level. So... It, it is very tone deaf and it feels like we're sort of in the stone ages here as far as like, I, I'm going to do some research on this uh, over the coming days and I want to see if I can try and find people that are on this Australian classification board and see if it's just a bunch of old, old people? fossils. That's what I want to know. This is, sorry, I, I don't know why I'm not really taking a harboring to this, but like it, this also goes in the angle that like, okay, if you're against this, if you're against the drug using and it's, you know, maybe they're going some angle where they're saying like Australia has a drug problem or something like that and they don't want that additional influence, then th- then by the same standard, they should be just as strict on gambling and video games because Australia has a really bad gambling, um, you know, problem. They also have a really like mm-hmm. a bad alcohol problem as well. So then they should just be putting the foot down on all of these influential things that are in video games as well. So... Mm. But you know they won't no, because of not. the government makes too much money off exactly. gambling and alcohol. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's a whole, whole um, can of worms right there. That yeah. yeah, the drugs are bad because the government can't make any money off drugs here in Australia. But well, alcohol you, and gambling you can if and cigarettes. You want to. Yeah. Well, once yeah, once they legalize marijuana. <laughs> completely off sorry i'm really diverging i I, (laughs) one of my friends over here sent me an article saying that australia is thinking about making uh medical mushrooms uh legal which i thought was wild considering like weed was still not legal like medicinal weed i think is but like yeah wild there's no like there's no like generic dispensaries around like you, you can obviously um get a get a medical certificate, I guess you call it, or a, like a doctor's. Know, doc- yeah. Yeah. Doctor's approved, whatever, whatever the word is, you, you can, you can have some medicinal marijuana, um, a small quantity, but it's nowhere near like what it is in, in other parts of the world. It'll change here in Australia in the next five years, I think, because the amount of money that, yeah, the government can then make off this is the big thing, but just the old fossils at the top are like, no, we can't do that. That's horrible. But yeah, here, he have all this alcohol, all these cigarettes, or all this gambling that ruins families and lives more so than drugs. So, uh, yeah, what do we know? What do we? What know? do we know? But I'm going to report back next week and see from my uh, very scattershot research that I'm going to be doing about who is on the Australian Classification Board mm. and the over under that I'm going to say 60% of the people on that classification board are just old, old, old white dudes will be very high. I feel like more women. I don't know why. It's just that, you know, drugs are bad. Think of the children. Very Simpsons. Yeah, yeah. We'll find out. We'll report back, listeners. And the last bit of news we wanted to bring to the table today. Publisher Perfect World and developer Black Wings have announced Persona 5, the Phantom X for iOS and Android, a free-to-play game with in-app purchases. Playtests for the new Persona 5 spin-off will start on March the 29th in China. The Phantom X's style and gameplay is exactly the same as in Persona 5, but the game's user experience will be tailored for mobile gamers. Atlas is supervising the game's development also. Persona 5, the, the Phantom X, follows a new group of Phantom Thieves and focuses on the theme of desire. Like in Persona 5, the protagonist in The Phantom X can participate in classes during the school day and do activities like watching movies and playing baseball. 
After school, the new Phantom Thieves can infiltrate the metaverse uh-oh, and the accompanying <laughs> palaces. In many respects, it looks basically the same as the original game, but with a handful of new characters, whereas Persona 5's mascot was the Black Cat Morgana. The Phantom X's animal mascot is an owl who wields dual tonfas as its weapon of choice. There are also some familiar characters such as Igor, as well as what it looks to be a brand new attendant in the Velvet Room. There are also what appears to be two female Phantom Thieves, one wielding a crossbow and the other a rifle. No official release date has been announced for the for Persona 5 Phantom X as of yet. But yeah, the uh, playtesting shall commence on March the 29th in China, and then it will mm. no doubt ripple across the rest of the world. But yeah, Persona 5, the Phantom X, getting that Persona 5 mobile experience. You in, you out, what you feeling? Well, as the person who said that their New Year's resolution was to play the Persona game finally, um, I was like, oh, do I get a do I get an easy way out and playing a um, mobile <laughs> version? Uh, but no, I'll still play like the actual um, original like persona 5 but i was so interested in this because like my brain kind of said like could a mobile game honestly sorry can a mobile actually handle a game of this like quality and like based on the trailer that they've already released for it it looks good like it looks like just like persona 5 and um i i think it could be really fun um making it free is an interesting choice and then in-game uh purchases i would be curious to see what they are i don't know maybe it'll be like styling like gifts or, or that sort of stuff but i mean i like it's it'll have i'm assuming the same kind of soundtrack which was incredible and the art style is awesome so yeah it sounds pretty good for a mobile game it intrigues me i i enjoy persona i enjoyed persona 5 quite a bit it is worrying that the game is is free, so I'm wondering how many barriers to entry they're going to be constantly throwing up, whether it be not only just in-game advertisements, but also like, oh, sorry, in order to play this next chapter or this next mission, pay up, or you need to, you know, buy gems oh, or whatever their currency is going to be. Chapter purchases, yeah. Because because you know they ain't doing this just for the sake of. People love Persona, so let's make a game and the world will be happy there. Like, people love Persona, so let's get every dollar out of these people we can. So mm-hmm. I'm scared that it's going to be a little predatory, but I'm, I'm keen. I'm keen. Like, I, I all I play on my phone is Marvel Snap, which I still adore. It's great. Um, collector score nearly 3,200 if anyone's playing along at home. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm curious to give it a go. And if I could play this from the, the comfort of my bed or something like that and maybe chuck the phone onto the backbone and play a little bit of Persona 5, the Phantom X before bed. Cool. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It it certainly looks, like you said, it looks impressive from the trailer. Like the old mobile phone seems to have enough grunt to make this game look and play and and feel good. But uh, we'll wait to see what happens when it actually gets officially released, I guess sometime in the back half of uh, 2023. Yeah, we'll have to see. Yeah, but shout out also to um, the the owl. I'm a sucker for owls in games or just in general. I love owls, so it's nice they're to quite see. Cute. All... Yeah, very cute, and he's rocking jewel tonfas. You know, they're great weapons. More <laughs> more games need to utilize the old tonfa sticks. So uh, yeah, it's awesome to see. But uh, let's shift gears into this tweet of the week, <laughs> and this tweet comes via way of at folly underscore studio. That is F O double L. Y underscore studio. So uh, this is coming from the fantastic developers known as Studio Folly. And they say, we have fantastic news. Gubbins is available on the iOS app store in Australia and New Zealand right now, in all caps. For now, there is no monetization, no ads, and no funny business for your unbridled entertainment. Make some words, tell your pals. So if you search Gubbins, which is G-U-B-B-I-N-S, um, it's it's a word based game. Mm-hmm. It is super cute, super fun, and it's free. So get that in your gullet as soon as you can. So shout out to Studio Folly for confirming their game is available on iOS here in the AU and NZ markets. Not sure if it's uh, available on the US or the broader global app stores at the moment. But anyone mm. listening from here in ANZ, do yourselves a favor and download Gubbins because it is a ton of goddamn fun. It looks absolutely adorable. The art style kind of reminds me of um, 
Yellow Submarine, like the Beatles kind of, mm-hmm. um, like that kind of era, that kind of like wackiness in our style. It's very cute. I, I also love the concept of it being like this like weird and wacky uh, word game as well. So awesome, awesome news for Studio Foley. Yeah, 100%, 100%. But um, yeah, that's available right now. But if once you're done playing a little bit of Gubbins, don't worry, because we have you covered. New releases and events. All right, as far as new things coming to the small screen via an assortment of streamers, Louis Theroux Forbidden America Season 2 is coming out this week, as well as C- oh, Season 1, sorry, of Louis Theroux Forbidden America. Season 2 of Yellow Jackets oh. drops this week, which I am hyped as hell for. And another one I want to shout out personally, Manfire Food Season 9 is coming out. Uh, I get so, so hungry watching that show or that reality cooking show all the time. Uh, things coming to the big screen. Obviously, John Wick Chapter 4 making its way to cinemas this week, currently holding a score of 77 on Metacritic. But uh, there has been some 10s getting thrown yeah. around. I saw IGN dropping a hard 10 on this one this week, as well as a 10 on Resident Evil 4 remake, which I'm excited for. But they've said that this is like the best John Wick movie to date in the franchise. So I'm very excited to check out Chapter 4 this week. As far as games coming out, We've got Remnant from the Ashes, To Chia, Have a Nice Death, Eight Liar Rise Out 3, Alchemist of the End, and The Secret Key. Holy guacamole. That is that is a game title right there. Mm-hmm. At Liar Rise Out 3, Alchemist of the End, and The Secret Key. We've also got Storyteller, EA Sports, PGA Tour, and as I just mentioned, Resident Evil 4 Remake, all coming out this coming week. I cannot wait to talk in detail and in depth about Resident Evil 4 on episode 320 of THG. But Miss Hart, anything there on the small or big screen or games that you are especially excited about? I've got too many. Like, like I, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to get my hands on Resident Evil, but it'll probably be played in this household. But between season passes of Destiny and Fortnite, it's, it's a balancing act. It really is. <laughs> Mm. Not enough hours in the day sometimes, Miss Hart. Really? Not enough mm-hmm. hours in the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but no, I'm very, very excited to, to, to yeah, watch John Wick. I'm very excited to watch Yellow Jackets and also work my way through Resident Evil 4 Remake because, uh, yeah, the reviews warm my heart very, very much mm. on that game. But Miss Hart, that brings us to the official end of THG 319. Anything else you wanted to shout out or mention before we got in out of here for another week? Yeah, I just want to put out a message um, on the passing of um, Lance Reddick. It's just uh, go out there and tell people that do things that you love and appreciate. Take a moment just to let them know that you love what they do. Um, don't do it to expect anything out of it or any kind of acknowledgement, but just, just putting it out there could really like brighten someone's day and you won't know the next time you'd be able to do it. So just share the love, let people out there, you know, that you love them and uh, take, take the time to, you know, show some appreciation and put some kindness into the world. Perfectly agree. And perfectly said, because um, yeah, life's short, life's unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen, let alone tomorrow, but later this afternoon. So yeah, let, let the ones that you love and care about know that you love and care about them. So yeah, uh, yeah, 8 Bit Nation, it's time for us to get out of here again. So we're going to say goodbye for now. But until next time, much love. And stay hungry. You've been listening to The Hungry Gamers, one of many gaming and geek culture related podcasts from the 8 Bit Collective over on 8bit.net. Check out more episodes on your podcast service of choice. And while you're there, please be sure to rate and subscribe. Until next time, boys and girls, stay hungry.